morning and welcome to the radio program, A Closer Walk, brought to you by the family of faith at Prairie Chapel United Methodist Church. Let's praise God today, this program today. And you know, in recent weeks, we've been looking at the man by the name of Paul. He's called the Apostle to the Gentiles. And it's especially because of Paul that we folks in this part of the world come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Most of you in our listening audience, I dare say, are Gentiles. Germans or English or Irish or our ancestral tree has its roots in a lot of Eastern European countries. I think the less of us are Chinese, as example, and I'll bet a few of you have ancestors who were Jewish. So we'd be termed more than likely Gentiles in the Bible, God's holy word. If that's the case, well, this guy by the name of Paul, again, is uh, maybe the author uh, of so much of the scripture that means so much to us. He used to be known as Saul, and, and he did have Jewish roots. He was termed in scriptures a Hebrew of Hebrews. But after Jesus the Christ came and lived and died and by the power of God rose again, Paul was one of the men who were significantly changed in how they believed. He came to know Jesus as the promised Messiah from the Old Testament scriptures, and it's recorded that he met the resurrected Jesus and was transformed by that meeting. Paul, who once persecuted people who followed Jesus, now is the one, well, he's the one being persecuted, and he's standing up boldly for Jesus anywhere, anytime. One trip took this missionary for Jesus to a town called Ephesus. And while he was there, visitors from the church in Corinth, a a church that Paul had planted some three years before this, around uh, 55 uh, AD, the, the group of visitors report some disturbing news to him. They tell Paul that there are some factions, there's some division in the church back in Corinth. And there's immorality going on. And there's people in the body of believers that are, they're even suing each other over what some folks would say are some pretty minor things. Sounds like today, huh? Who says the Bible is irrelevant for us today? And even beyond that, there's problems in people's marriages leading to divorce. Sound familiar? And there's questions about what's okay for people to eat back in that day. There are battles over worship. Oh my goodness. And questions about resurrection. A lot there, huh? But we have to remember first and foremost, these letters of Paul were written especially for that day, for those people addressing issues that they had then. And we can't just apply everything, every little aspect of Paul's answers to them to us today. Because, well, frankly, the world we live in is different from 55 AD, isn't it? But that doesn't make it all irrelevant. Recorded in our Bibles for our understanding today, uh, Paul begins his writing in the usual way of those days with a really nice greeting and then a thanksgiving. And then he just dives right in. He dives right into the problems that he's been hearing about. Uh, The biggie he's heard about are problems with divisions in the church. Now, right off the bat, I think it's safe to say we need to hear Paul's words today. Okay, he says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. You see, he's heard about divisions in the church and he's saying, hey, folks, stop it. I came to offer good news, not any reason for you to be fighting. I came to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, and and do it the best I can. You're fighting amongst yourself is, well, that's taking away from the power of, of the cross in people's lives. He says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning will I thwart. It's it's dangerous to be wise in our own eyes, he's telling us. We can be so wise in our own eyes that we don't even think we need a Savior. Uh, Now, in Paul's greeting to the church, he's, he's quick to encourage the church also. He tells them, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Jesus Christ. You see, he boosts them up and he reminds them that even if he's about to find some serious faults with them, It doesn't take away from what God has done. 
God is still God and God still loves you and God is still calling you and his church. His church will stand. You are a holy people. That's who you are. But, but sometimes you're not acting that way. <laughs> Holiness has little to do with goodness. You know, God makes us holy. And because of that, then it's our responsibility in response to God's love that we act out of love for others. Yeah, to take that love to others, to be filled then with goodness. Paul wants them to see that no quarrel that they may have among themselves can completely destroy God's work in their lives. But, oh, how it hurts their witness, doesn't it? When we're fighting this little difference and that little difference between you and me, you know, uh, between United Methodists and Presbyterians, between Catholics and Baptists, between Independents and Orthodox, what do you think that does? What it does is hurts the faith of, of someone who may be on the outside looking in as example. They may feel drawn to the church, but then they quickly can be persuaded. You know, you don't want to have anything to do with them. They're just a bunch of hypocrites. Wow. Disunity in the faith really hurts, doesn't it? He reminds people that the message of the cross, empowered by the Holy Spirit, is the basis for true unity. Some folks won't get it but it's the cross that should unite us. And he soon goes on in chapter three to say that as spiritual people, we shouldn't live our lives in a typical worldly manner. God wants all Christians to remember to whom they belong. And when we remember whose we are, then we should better act out who we are. Sinners saved by grace of God. It should affect the way that we live our lives. Because, friends, all believers will be judged for their works and rewarded according to our service one day. You know, Paul's letter to the Corinthians is filled with many challenges for the believers to act like Christians. The most serious problem is worldliness. They were unwilling to let go of the culture around them, you see. Their old ways of doing things was was kind of messing up their newfound faith in Jesus and their testimony to the resurrected Lord. Now, friends, the, the corrupt Corinthian culture of Paul's day looked a lot like our culture today. And sadly, the people in many of today's churches display that same spiritual immaturity that Paul saw in the Corinthian believers. Things like immorality, divorce, lawsuits, divisions, misuse of spiritual gifts, and a lack of love. They're as much a problem today as they were back then, aren't they? So what's the answer? Well, friends, it's the same for us today as it was back then. Just as Paul attempts to correct the Corinthians through proper teaching, you and I need to correct our behavior with a proper understanding of God's Word. Whether we realize it or not, our behavior is being influenced by our culture and our culture, friends, is just filled with wrong kinds of thinking. And wrong living is directly related to that wrong thinking. With God's help, with God's help, we can bring our behavior back in line with God's standards. How can we do that? Well, for one, through faithful reading, studying, and obeying God's word. And friends, that's really why I just praise God for your tuning in week in and week out to this program called A Closer Walk. I pray that you are praying for this program, that I will be faithful in sharing God's word in this time and in this place. You know, true strength begins with the knowledge that, that all we are comes as a result of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Our relationship with Christ brings about spiritual fruit. You know, it's been harvest time here in South Central Ohio, and we've been enjoying a pretty nice harvest, I think. I, I've been told some of the prices for this harvest have, have been as good as it has been in years and years. And it's a good harvest. And God wants a good harvest for us in our spiritual lives too, friends. What does that harvest look like? Well, it looks like kindness. Kindness to those we know up close and personal, as well as kindness to those we may not even know. Even the stranger, you know, uh, it looks like goodness, just good old fashioned goodness. And it looks like faithfulness, faithfulness to God and faithfulness to each other. And it looks like gentleness, being slow to anger, friends, being gentle with one another. And that, and that looks like self-control. And how about humility and authenticity? If you say you're a Christian, then be one. 
these gifts for strengthen our hearts and the hearts of our community of faith together, you know, the church together. They enable us to do God's work and they empower us to endure hardship and sorrow along the way too. You know, earlier I said the writer Paul gives us this powerful thought that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So my closing question for today is this, why do you attend the church that you attend? Of course, I'm making the assumption that you do attend church, aren't I, friends? I sure hope that's the case because that's what God wants for us, to be in fellowship and God shows us that even in himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that perfect fellowship. So back to my question. Why do you attend the church you attend? Commentator Roger Grinch says our answer might be, well, I'm a member of this church because it cares for the poor and the outcast. Another might say because of Pastor so-and-so, who's a great preacher or a loving pastor. Or another it promises that faith will lead to prosperity and prosperity to social success. That's why I attend there. Well, in some sense, all of those point to pride, don't they? Flannery O'Connor tells the story of Ruby Turpin, a, a woman obsessed by status consciousness, a woman of pride. In her story, uh, Ruby entered a doctor's waiting room, sizing up everyone there in the room as to their class. In fact, at night, Ruby would occupy herself by naming the classes of people. On the bottom, in her worldview, were poor blacks and white trash. Uh, above them were homeowners like her and her husband, Claude. And on top were the people with lots of money and much bigger homes. You know, she used to struggle with this, thinking that there were some folks who had lots of money who were very common in her mind and ought to be below she and Claude. While Mrs. Turpin was reflecting out loud, yeah, out loud in the doctor's waiting room one time, there happened to be a student sitting there reading a book entitled Human Development. Well, that student decided she had had just about as much of Ruby Turpin as she could, un could just stand, you know. So she hurled the book across the room, hitting Mrs. Turpin just above the left eye, and then began to strangle her, saying, Go back to hell where you came from, you old warthog. Wow. Well, in some respects, Paul's words challenging the people of Corinth were no less jolting than a book on human development above the left eye. You see here, Paul is reminding them of the foolishness of the gospel of the crucified Christ. You see, crucifixion was more than a state-sponsored execution. It was meant to demean and shame the victim. It may have been even terribly embarrassing to the early Christians that their Lord had met this fate of crucifixion. But by enduring the shameful death, Jesus overcame our shame and letting, lets us experience the boundless love of God. Christ takes the ultimate weight of shame to live our heaviest and most secret burden, the feeling that no one loves or respects us. Oh, you ask what happened to Ruby Turpin. Well, later that evening, she went into the pasture beside her house and was talking to herself again, puzzling over the reason for that assault. She stood there gazing into the evening sky until there was only a purple streak cutting across the skyline like an extension of the highway. It was then that she saw a vast swinging bridge extending upward from the earth and, and she visualized a horde of souls marching toward heaven. There were companies of white trash, clean for the first time in their lives, and bands of blacks in white robes, and battalions of lunatics shouting and clapping and leaping like frogs, and bringing up the end of the procession was a tribe of people that she recognized were just like her, those who had always had a little of everything and the God-given wit to use it right. They were marching behind the others with dignity, accountable as they had always been for good order and common sense and respectable behavior. She could tell, however, that they were no better off than any of the others. They were all heading for the same place. By the grace of God, we all enter God's kingdom on the same level playing field. Only a sinner saved by grace. Friends, I pray for unity in our churches today. All filled with sinners. Sinners like you and me. Saved by the grace of God. No more, no less. 
Friends, I'm Pastor Everett Stoddard. From the chapel, on the prairie, in Coshocton, 